Well, good evening. I'm pleased to welcome you to what I think is the first ever Mises University debate. The subject, as you see from your program, is as follows. Resolved, it is smart to get a PhD in economics. Uh, arguing in favor of the resolution is Walter Block. Uh, Walter, you have already been introduced. <laughs> You've already been introduced to Walter uh, earlier today. He is the Harold E. Worth Eminent Scholar uh, at Loyola University, New Orleans, and holds a PhD in economics from Columbia University, so that would make him smart. Um, <laughs> Arguing against the resolution is Gary North. Uh, Gary is the proprietor of GaryNorth.com and a prolific scholar. Yeah. And Gary holds a PhD in history from uh, University of California at Riverside. Uh, the game plan is to uh, allow each speaker 15 minutes for an overview then each will get 10 minutes to offer a first rebuttal of the other's comments and to offer additional comments, and then each will have five minutes for a second rebuttal. Uh, I will be moderating and keeping the time up front, and feel free to use cat calls and whistles if anyone tries to go over his allotted time. <laughs> so without further ado, I turn the floor over to Walter Block. This is an unusual debate for me. I'm used to debating pinkos and commies and right-wingers and such like, and I'm sure Gary uh, has had a similar experience. We're here, uh, Gary and I agree on 99.8% of everything, and I'm not sure what the other 0.2% is except for this one issue. So it's a strange kind of a debate, more of a debate within the family than of uh, uh, contending philosophies because we agree pretty much on these things. I'm not totally happy with it is smart to get a PhD in economics. I, I guess I'd be more comfortable. It's a good idea uh, to get a PhD in economics, more moderate, or at least for some people. Certainly, I don't think it's a great idea for everyone to get a PhD in economics. I mean, what about history or philosophy or something? And, and if everyone got a PhD in something, what about plumbing and carpentry? You know, we'd be in trouble, no food. Uh, the comparative advantage and specialization would mitigate against everyone getting a PhD. So. As is my name, Walter Moderate Block, I'm taking a very moderate position. And I'm disgusted with Gary. I mean, he's such an extremist. I mean, <laughs> he's so disgustingly extreme. And, you know, we need more moderation here. I mean, Gary doesn't want anyone to get a PhD in economics, I think. I'm not sure. I'll have to let him speak for himself. But that, based on my readings of his many, many uh, brilliant rewritten articles in uh, lourockwell.com, uh, He'll correct me if I'm wrong, but I think his position is, you know, no one should get a PhD in economics, and I, I can't go along with that. I'm going to divide my comments into two subsections. One, why it's a good idea to get a PhD in economics from the movement's point of view, the Austro-Libertarian movement, how, we, how getting a PhD in economics will help us promote liberty. Uh, that will be one section of my talk. And the other section of my talk will be, uh, from a personal point of view, will it behoove you, will it benefit you personally to go out and get a PhD in economics or not? What are the positives and what are the negatives? Okay, so uh, with regard to the movement, I um, want to say that getting a PhD in economics and people who have had PhDs in economics have made signal contributions to liberty. And uh, this is not to say that there are people who have not got a PhD in economics, have not made a, a contribution to liberty, which is ridiculous. And uh, I made a list of people who don't have a PhD who have made contributions to either economics or Austrianism or libertarianism. Not all of the people I'm about to read off uh, I agree with on every jot and tittle, but I acknowledge that they have made contributions. For example, David Friedman has a PhD in physics. Henry Manny and Gordon Tullock, who have made contributions to economics, have law degrees. Gary North has a PhD in history. Tom Woods has a PhD in history. Ron Hamway and Ralph Rako, PhDs in history. Eleanor Ostrom, with whom I don't agree, 
But still, I acknowledge she's made contributions to economics, has a PhD in political science. Laura Davidson, who's made magnificent contributions to Austrian macro theory, is an airline pilot. Carl Hess has made contributions. Uh, our own Lou Rockwell, Doug French, and Jeff Tucker have made contributions to economics without a PhD. Charles Murray has got a PhD in political science. The list goes on and on. There are many, many uh, think tanks where people have a master's degree or not a PhD, sometimes no degree at all. Uh, a, a degree in economics is no guarantee of anything, but on the other hand, it, it is um, a help, I, I contend. Brian Doherty wrote a book, Radicals for Capitalism, and he picked five people who he said made contributions to uh, our movement. Again, I don't agree with all the f five that he picked, but four out of five have PhDs in economics. Uh, Mises, Hayek, Rothbard, and Friedman, Milton Friedman, all have PhDs in economics and have made some contributions. Again, we don't have to agree with everything they've said, but we can acknowledge that they've made contributions. Rand, Ayn Rand is the only one of the five, the top five who have made contributions. Uh, she doesn't have any degree at all. Uh, if I had to add a sixth person to uh, Brian Doherty's list, I'd add Ron Paul, who again doesn't have a PhD in economics, but does have some credential. I mean, he is a doctor. Uh, Ludwig von Mises said, everyone carries a part of society on his shoulders. No one is relieved of, of his share of responsibility by others, and no one can find a safe way out for himself if society is sweeping toward destruction. Therefore, everyone in his own interest must thrust himself vigorously into the intellectual battle. None can stand aside with unconcern. The interest of everyone hangs on the result. Whether he chooses or not, every man is drawn into the great historical struggle, the decisive battle into which our epoch has plunged us. So we've got to fight the power, got to fight the man. How? With a gun? That's silly. We have no comparative advantage. And in any case, ideas are more powerful than the gun. The, the pen is mightier than the sword because the pen determines in which direction the sword is pointed. So what we have to do, and, and certainly what the Mises Institute does, is tries to promote and uh, discover and create new ideas in favor of liberty and, and sound Austrian economics. So ideas are very important. It doesn't, you don't have to be an economics professor to promote and create ideas. Uh, Hayek talked about secondhand dealers in ideas, journalists, clergy, anyone whose day job it is to promote ideas would be wonderful. Uh, 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 I would encourage people to do that. There was this movie, Reds. Warren Beatty played John Reed, who was a commie journalist. And the Lenin character said, I'd give 50 professors for one John Reed. Well, I tell you, if 50 of you people in five or 10 years had your PhDs and were professors of economics promoting liberty, I'd be very happy. And perhaps 50 to 1 is the correct ratio. I mean, Lenin uh, isn't wrong on everything. He might be uh, correct on this. I'm a Leninist now. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so this is, uh, you know, if we had one journalist uh, of the John, what John Reed did for communism, doing what, what is being done, uh, uh, doing what could be done for liberty, uh, that would be great. So I would encourage people to get into the intellectual debate to promote liberty. Economics professors are good, journalists are good, clergymen are good, any, uh, any sort of uh, activity, working in a think tank, uh, what have you. Let me uh, give a, an inkling of my own career. Uh, and what I'm now going to do is read off a list of former students of mine who have made some contributions to liberty. Again, I don't agree with everything that any, all of them have done, but I think that they have made some contributions to liberty. And what I'm going to say is that a PhD in economics is sufficient. It, it can help. Not sufficient, but it, it can certainly help, although it's certainly not necessary. When I taught at Rutgers uh, in the 1970s, Richie Fink was a student of mine, and he is now an officer at the Koch Foundation. From Holy Cross, where I was from 91 to 97, Ed Stringham is now the Hackley Endowed Chair for Capitalism and Free Enterprise Studies at the Fayetteville State University. Andy Young is now an associate professor at West Virginia University. Billy Costius, associate professor at Cleveland State University. Lionel Beener, PhD candidate in political science at Yale. Ken Garshina, an investment banker, Mises Institute contributor. 
from Loyola, where I have been from 2001 to the present, Dan D'Amico, who was my former student. Again, I don't take credit for these people. Uh, many other influences influenced these people, but I had maybe some small a role in their uh, development. Dan is now my uh, colleague. He's a, uh, an assistant professor at Loyola University. Emily Schaefer, assistant professor at San Jose State University. Jenny Dermar, assistant professor at Hampton Sydney University. Uh, Loyola students of mine who are now in the midst of a PhD program are Nick Snow, Mark Melanson, and Chris Fleming. Vedran Vuk, another former student of mine, is a senior editor with Doug Casey Enterprises, all making contributions, all who I had some small part in in uh, their development, and I'm very delighted that I was able to do that. And if some of you got PhDs in economics and got jobs teaching economics and had students of this sort, I'm sure you'd be very uh, grateful as well. Okay, now I want to move to uh, the second part of my talk where I said I wouldn't talk about the movement, but I would talk about from an individual personal point of view, does it make sense to go out and get a PhD in economics? Well, let me talk about the bad. The bad part of this is that math has uh, been elevated into a restriction on entry almost. Uh, the economics profession in uh, the U.S. is hyper-mathematical, even in the uh, least prestigious universities and in the most prestigious universities, pretty much all you do is math. Sometimes my colleagues and I suggest to students that they not major, major in economics as undergraduates, rather major in math and maybe minor in economics. So intense has math uh, taken over. Yet, uh, I've had some luck in getting students through uh, George Mason University. There are some students here uh, at Suffolk University. Uh, are, are they in the room? If they are, would you raise your hand or stand up? Maybe they're downstairs. Uh, there are people studying with Guido Holtzman in France, uh, Huerta de Soto in Spain, Sima in um, Poland. If you are interested in knowing where you can go and get a PhD in economics, with some Austrian content, not as much as you or I might like, but some content, email me and I will give you a list of places where you might go. Many of these places give you a full ride. You get a full, full scholarship, no tuition, and you'll get 15 or 20,000 bucks to keep your body and soul together. So the only investment you're making, or the big part of the investment you're making, is the alternative costs of your time, what you could have been earning uh, had you not gone for a PhD. Also, there are, uh, while I'm mentioning schools, there are several schools uh, where, as undergraduates, you might consider going or tell your younger siblings some of the schools where my students are now teaching, such as San Jose, Hampton, Sydney, Grove City, uh, where uh, Professor Herbener speaks, um, my own school. Uh, these are places where you can get some Austrian uh, economics. Okay, in addition, uh, the reason I mention these schools is because they are the least mathematically inclined. The ones in Europe, all you need is a master's degree uh, from a, a U.S. school. And to get a master's degree, you don't really have to do this hyper math. And then you go over to Europe and get a Ph.D. Uh, mainly what you do is you write your dissertation, but you'd have to ask Guido and these other people exactly what the details are. And you can come back here and get a job. Uh, Richard Ebeling is my only uh, case in point, the, my, my only uh, one example that I know of who got a PhD in a European school that was not uh, the London School of Economics or one of the most prestigious ones. And he was the president of FEE for a while. And now he is a professor at Northwood uh, University. So that's not too shabby. You can get a job and uh, train students in, in Austro-Libertarianism in that way. The other problem beside the hyper-mathematicality of the PhD in economics is that there's an academic bias toward the left. But this means that economics is probably the least uh, susceptible to this. Uh, the the uh, leftist bias is much more heavily uh, endowed in history, law, philosophy, poli-sci, sociology than in economics. There are some people here uh, I think one of uh, uh, the uh, uh, summer fellows uh, was getting a PhD in sociology, and I was amazed because, you know, most sociologists are not uh, open to free enterprise, and yet he seems to be prospering. But I would recommend economics over sociology because uh, sociology is way worse than economics. Economics is not as good as it could be, but it's infinitely better or way better than some of these other fields. Uh, 
Okay, let me now talk about the good from a personal point of view. Uh, why is it good to get a job, not so much for the movement's point of view, but for your own uh, personal economic self-interest? Take me, for example. I teach three courses a year, uh, 15 weeks times three hours, 45 hours, uh, round to 50 hours for marking exams, 150 hours. My salary is 175 a year. So every class hour I teach, I get $1,166. That's pretty good. Uh, it, it's not as good as making a killing in the market or something, and you can make a lot more as an entrepreneur, but $1,166 per hour isn't too bad. How about a new assistant professor like Dan D'Amico? Six courses a year, 15 weeks, three hours a week, 45 hours, round to 50 times six, 300 hours. Uh, that means that his hourly salary is $75 an hour. Again, not so bad. You get... Um, uh, if you double it for publishing and committee meetings and butt kissing, uh, <laughs> which you have to do as a non-tenured person, well, then uh, your salary is um, uh, 125 an hour, not too bad. Vacations, 22 weeks a year, nine hours of work a week, uh, two or three days. I mean, you know, you can't match that in the business world. Okay, maybe you can't get a job as an assistant professor. How about as an adjunct? Well, as an adjunct, all you do is you teach, but uh, if the uh, salary per course is $4,000 a course, then that's $88 an hour. If it's $3,500, it's $77 an hour, and it's $3,000, it's $66 an hour. Uh, Gary talks about minimum wage jobs. I don't know where he gets those figures, but even an adjunct, uh, which... I mean, most people that get a PhD aren't adjuncts, at least in economics, because there are so many alternatives in economics. Whereas if you get a PhD in literature or poetry or something like that, then you are more likely to get an adjunct. Uh, thanks, my time is up, and he's bigger than me. <laughs> This is a formal debate, and any wise debater always asks himself before that debate begins, who will the judges be and what criteria will they use to make the judgment? When I proposed this debate to Walter as a way of settling our differences on this issue, I had a very definite group of judges in mind, specifically college students, perhaps the second semester of the junior year, first semester of the senior year. I propose that we do it at Mises University, at the Institute, but at this particular session because there are more undergraduates here than, say, at the Austrian Scholars Conference. I want, most of all, to get a video out of this, or perhaps an MP3 file, because on a permanent basis I want this to be available to students over a long period of time to help them make that judgment. And so that is why I propose the debate. That's why I'm very glad that I have an opportunity to make this, uh, this presentation. Now, you have the problem here of getting advice from a 70-year-old economist and a 69-year-old historian who went through school a long, long time ago under a very different set of conditions and facing, quite frankly, in their careers, very different conditions from what you are going to face in the next 10 or 15 years if we have Congress working full time the way Congress has been working. So what I'm saying is what you really need to do is make assessments of your own situation with some guidance, but you do need to make the decisions based on what I believe are rational economic criteria. So let's start with the basic economics where most of us have started in this movement, and that is with Hazlitt's wonderful little book on economics in one lesson. Let's go to chapter two, which is the famous story of the broken mirror or the broken glass, the broken window pane. And the standard analysis would be that if that individual has to pay now to get it fixed, to get it replaced, to get it installed, that's going to spend money into the economy and therefore there will be a boost of the local economy because of this original spending. Now that, of course, came from Bastiat's wonderful essay all those years ago in 1850. Hazlitt 
resurrected it. And the answer to it is it's bad economics because you have to look at the alternative cost. What would he have done with the money if he had not had his window broken? And that's what he really wanted to do, not this alternative of the broken window. I want to, I want to rework this image. I want to talk about the window that is not broken. And the not broken window is the PhD economist who has tenure or is in a tenure track position. And you ask him, is it a good idea to get this PhD? And the fellow who has not broken his window says, yes, it's a great idea. Look at what I've done. Look at what I've been able to do over the years. Look at my situation. What I want you to do is look at the shattered window, the shattered glass. And the problem with that is you can't get straight testimony on that because those who went through the experience and did not survive don't talk about it. They don't leave records of it. You can't get interviews with them. So we have to make judgments <clears throat> about it. And I want to say at the beginning, I do not want you to join the fellowship of the shattered glass because it can be shattered dreams. It can be shattered finances. So before you get into this advanced program, you have to count the costs. Now, as good economists, let's start with the basic costs that we all have to deal with inevitably, and that is the very simple out-of-pocket costs. You have, you have room, board, tuition, textbooks. If you go to Supreme Universities, the one we all want to get into, probably didn't, the Ivy League schools, you're talking $50,000 a year, and then you have to figure out how many years you're going to be there. Now, you may get a fellowship in this, or of course, you may get a teaching assistancy. But remember what that means. You are going into a Keynesian university. You are going to be an adjunct assistant, low paid, to a Keynesian professor. You're going to grade in terms of Keynesian standards. You're going to subject your brain, your mind, your hopes, your dreams for four to six years to Keynesian principles. You're going to see cost curves going wildly up and demand curves going wildly down. <laughs> now, if you're willing to do that, yes, you can get through the Ivy League school. If not, you go to a less prestigious school, you may pay 25,000 a year, you go to a state university, you may even get out for even less. But the point is there are out-of-pocket expenses. But those are not the big ones. Let's go to the economic expenses, the ones we know most, that is the forfeited income. Uh, Dr. Block has already mentioned one, that is you could get a job that will generate income, you will not get that income. And that is a loss. You have to count that as part of your loss. The second thing you're going to miss is that for any career, you need between 5,000 and 10,000 hours of really dedicated work to master the terms of that career, to get the head start, to get that real advantage that you need to be successful in the career. If you spend four to six years in a program of, with a PhD in economics and you don't wind up in a field in which that would have been an advantage, entrepreneurship, whatever you want to go into, then you have that problem, especially if you don't get the degree. Now the third thing, which I think is really vastly more important, is this. You lose the time in which you could have learned Austrian economics. You have 400 books printed downstairs. One book a week is going to take you some time. You can master the basics of Austrian school economics in three to four years if you work at it on a disciplined basis. If you're going to learn Austrian economics, learn Austrian economics. Not Keynesian economics, mathematical economics, not Friedmanian economics, I think not even public choice economics. Why would you discipline yourself to learn something that Mises said is wrong? conceptually, philosophically wrong. You're going to submit yourself for six years to a program in which you know you are presenting yourself as a sacrifice on an altar to a God you don't believe in. <laughs> now, I'll give you some from my world, which most of you don't know about. How many six-day creationists would sign up for a PhD program in paleontology at Harvard and say, I'm a six-day creationist. You all want me? <laughs> oh, baby, do they want you? Uh, the, the first sacrifice of the semester. Now, the point is... <laughs> so, it's, it's the risk factor. Now, I want to give you real-world 
judgment. There are, here are techniques you ought to use before you join any program. You've got to do this if you have a nickel's worth of sense. You find out how many students enrolled in the program at the beginning of the previous year, and you find out how many students were awarded the PhD. And you, and you see the attrition ratio. And that's going to scare you. And then the second thing you better find out is how many advanced to dissertation writing and how many finished. Because if you come out with the legendary ABD, all but dissertation, you are unemployable. And you better find out how many didn't make the cut at the dissertation level. Because if you don't do that, you are really going into a very high risk situation. Then you find out what's the median number of years for the average guy to finish in the program. If it's three years, is it four, is it five, you better find out before you go in. Murray Rothbard took 10 years. Do you want to do that? Now let's go to the next issue that I alluded to that is submission to a system that you don't like. The mathematics, the statistics, all of the rigmarole that are, uh, that are consistently opposed to what Austrian economics stands for and believes in. Why do you do it? Departments have goals. Now, of course, the basic goal of the department is keep enough students running through the system so that the uh, salaries keep coming in. That's your basic rule of every academic department. Let's talk about the basics. Four things. One, screen out the unbelievers. Two, convert the unbelievers. Three, persuade the unbelievers that value-free economics and scientific economics leads to the conclusion that you need more government coercion. And four, to send that new recruit out to be an evangelist for the position that you have just run him through. I don't see in at least if you do this, know that that's what you're getting into. The risks are really against you. Now, career. You get into a department. If you get the PhD, and you probably won't, find out statistically if you got a shot. But if you get the PhD, and if you get a tenure track position, which is not as easy as you have been led to believe, but if you get that, then you're going to spend your time with professors who don't hold your view, who regard you as some sort of an eccentric, may regard you as a menace, and certainly, all things considered, think you're the equivalent of the crazy ant in the attic. <laughs> and the reason for that is because all of them know that you believe they are dupes of John Maynard Keynes, which in fact they are. <laughs> so you're in a high-risk position from the moment you go through the system. Now, textbooks, you're not going to select the textbooks. And I guarantee you this, I don't care how good it is, I mean even if it's a public choice textbook, you get to the section on the Federal Reserve and you know what? There's no analysis of the Federal Reserve in terms of what it is, which is a cartel established by the government to expand the state. There'll be no mention of any analysis from, from the chapter on cartels to apply to the Federal Reserve and that is not random. That is the price of playing the game within the modern academic system you are going to be the odd man out for the remainder of your career. This is if you get tenure, and you probably won't, because tenure, tenure track positions are hard to find. Not that many people get tenure. Now, if you think that's wrong, you better find out in the university that may give you that job where how many people have gotten tenure in the school that you want to teach in over the last, say, 20 years. Find out how many, how many of them left, how many of them are still doddering to class with their catheters attached. Because <laughs> uh, they're not leaving a hundred grand a year. And if you get into the other system, which he's already mentioned, which is the adjunct professor, you're getting into the union. You've heard analysis of union earlier today. The union is if you get in, you get the hundred grand a year, and if you don't get in, you get 35 grand a year, and you don't get retirement program, and you don't get the medical care, and you don't get any guarantees. And how do you get the guarantees? How do you get the guarantees that's so good above market? You've heard about above market wages. Let me tell you how. There's a guy with a badge and a gun, and the gun is pointed at the belly of a taxpayer, and the belly says, I don't want to pay. And the guy says, you're going to pay. And my gut says, I don't want to pay. I got this gun. I got this badge. You're going to pay. That's state universities. That's where most of the jobs are. Now you say, well, I don't want to teach in state university. I'll teach in a, in a private university. There you got the cartel system through accreditation. Another guy still got the gun, still got the badge that says, you can't call yourself a university unless you go through the hoops. That's the rule. 
Yeah, you get a bub market return because there's a guy with a badge and a gun. Do you want this for the rest of your life? Do you want that the basis of your income? The badge and the gun in between you and the market. You got to make that decision because someday there's going to be a bright young guy in the classroom who says, Professor, I understand Austrian economics. How come you're here? <laughs> and you better have an answer. Not an easy answer. The benefit, of course, is great. The greatest of the benefits was articulated by a colleague of mine in 1968 when we were in a graduate seminar and the professor asked the question, why are you getting a PhD? There was mumbling, there was fumbling, there was stumbling, but Gordon Geddes had the answer. And the answer was, I want a job where somebody will pay me to read. <laughs> That's a great answer. That's one of the great answers of all time. The problem is the PhD glut hit. Neither of us got our PhDs before the glut hit, and he did not get the job spending the rest of his life being paid to read. I did, but I got it in the free market sense and had to work a lot harder than the hours that uh, Dr. Block puts in. <laughs> but I do okay. So the answer to it is count the costs, look at the benefits, make the decision in terms of your life as to whether you think you ought to get a PhD in economics. Uh, I think Ari is absolutely right that our experience, if I can speak for the both of us, as students is very dated. My experience in academia is not dated at all. I've been in it for the last, I don't know how many years, 40 years or so. Uh, Gary's experience in academia is very dated, and I think that his understanding of it is, uh, well, let me just say it's very different than mine. Uh, yes, there are people who fail out of the program, and every student that I've sent off to uh, a graduate school uh, and left the program, I felt like I was kicked in the teeth. I, uh, I worked with these students, these students were enthusiastic, and they go to a school and then they leave. Uh, I've had a lot of uh, good luck with George Mason. Uh, I, I don't think that what they teach there is good Austrianism. It's sort of the first cousins of Austrianism as I see it. But it's quasi-demi-semi-Austrianism. And one of the good things about it is that the kids that go there come out with PhDs. Uh, not always. There are one or two that have not. Uh, Vedran Vuk is one who is, uh, he's an ABD or he's got a master's or something, but it doesn't mean he's unemployable. He's now working for Doug Casey. Yes, uh, not everybody who goes into the program comes out with a PhD. Gary is uh, absolutely right in, in stressing that. But there are schools where you can go and get the PhD and they've got a pretty good record of churning out people with PhDs. Uh, Gary talks about the uh, room and board, 50,000, uh, going to a um, Ivy League school where you're enthralled to the Keynesians, and he's quite right. That is a, a problem. But the schools that I'm recommending, and if you send me uh, a request for this information, I'll give it to you, aren't like that. Gary's information is either not is either dated or uh, wrong, or I'm not sure where he's getting his information from. I'm certainly not advocating that people go to uh, Berkeley and get a PhD there, although uh, Peter went there and uh, uh, seems to um, be okay. And, and, and <laughs> <laughs> But if you go to Berkeley uh, or Columbia where I went, it, it's much more problematic. Uh, now, what Gary says is, um, you know, you're going to go get a PhD and you'll do it at the cost of learning Austrianism. Now, this, I, I, I had a full head of hair before I started this uh, debate, and look at me now. I mean, <laughs> uh, this is 100% uh, wrong or 180 degrees wrong or whatever the, the right metaphor is. You go and study with Guido Holtzman in, in uh, Paris, or not Paris, in France somewhere, Angers, and you tell me you're not going to learn Austrian economics? You go study with Huerta de Soto in Spain, and you tell me you're not going to learn Austrian economics? You're going to be enthralled to Keynesians? Uh, you go to SEMA uh, in Poland, or uh, Matt Mackay, who is now in Poland. I, I'm not sure where all these guys are. I'm confused as to which countries there are in Europe. They keep changing it. <laughs> but Matt Mackay uh, won the, uh, the Pr uh, Prufrong Award two or three years ago. He's now a professor. He's not teaching uh, Keynesianism. Or if he is teaching Keynesianism, he's doing it the way you and I and other professors here do it, teach it, and then show the problems with it. So uh, Gary's information is, um, 
I don't know what, made up or, or, or just uh, uh, made up out of the whole cloth. I don't know where he's getting this from. Yes, if you go to Harvard or Columbia with Stiglitz or uh, Berkeley or these other places, then he's absolutely right. But you don't have to go to those places. You can get reasonable jobs uh, at uh, places like uh, where my former students are. So I, I think uh, Gary is 100% wrong on this. You go to Suffolk, we have two students, are, are they here from Suffolk? Uh, I don't see them, maybe they're downstairs. Uh, they're learning Austrian economics from Ben Powell. They, they, uh, one of the Manish uh, won the uh, proof wrong last year, I think it was, or the year before. I'm, I'm, I'm no historian, so I don't remember these things. But, <laughs> but uh, these are solid Austrian students, so you can't tell me that, that you're gonna be enthralled forever to Keynesianism. Uh, you're learning, yes, you have to learn Keynesianism, you have to know what's wrong with it. If you don't so much as know it, then then you, you're out there with a ship without a rudder, but you can learn uh, Keynesianism and the, the critiques of Keynesianism from the, some of these people. Yes, there's an attrition ratio. Not everybody who goes to uh, graduate school comes out with a PhD, but ABDs are not unemployable. Uh, usually they give you a master's if you don't uh, finish your dissertation, and you can get a job in any of these think tanks. There are 50 state think tanks. There are many beltway think tanks. Uh, where having a, a master's degree would be an improvement over not having a master's degree. Um, yes, Rothbard took 10 years, but that was because Arthur Burns, and he was at Columbia, he wasn't at any of these schools that I'm advocating. What happened with poor Murray is when Arthur Burns, thank God for Nixon, because when, uh, when Nixon got Arthur Burns down to Washington, then Murray snuck in and got his PhD, but as long as Arthur Burns was there, he couldn't um, do it. Um, adjuncts. Adjuncts are a problem of, for historians, for political scientists. In economics, there are so many alternatives to academia that all the students that I know of, my own personal students, they're not adjuncts. They've got, uh, uh, what do you call it, assistant professor tenure track jobs. Uh, some of them are too young to have gotten tenure, but many uh, people have gotten tenure. Um, so I, I don't see that. I mean, yes, not everyone gets tenure. In my own case, I didn't get tenure because I was really mouthy. I mean, you know, I accused him of extremism, but uh, truth uh, be known, I'm a bit of an extremist myself. I couldn't keep my big yap shut, and I kept wanting to debate my colleagues. I should have shut up and got tenure, but that's a whole other, a whole other area. So Gary is right. You don't, you don't get 100%, and, and I, I think it's very salutary, his contribution to, to this uh, debate. Now, this business of working in a state university, uh, here uh, Gary and I have a philosophical disagreement. I've worked in state universities, and uh, I don't see anything wrong with that. I think it's a virtue, I think it's a mitzvah to take money from the goddamn government because they stole it from us in the first place. Look, if, if, if Gary... <laughs> If Gary is, is a little um, unhappy with the prospect of taking money from a guy with a badge and a gun uh, through uh, coercion, how did he get here? He got here on a, pri on, a, on a private road? No, on a government road. Gary shouldn't be on the government roads if he's going to be logically consistent. Gary has fiat currency in his wallet. <laughs> not, not enough, but he's got some. Look, I like to say that we don't really get much accomplished at the Mises University, but at least we have fun. <laughs> and we do have fun, and actually we do get some stuff uh, accomplished. Look, Ga Gary is falling into the, the trap of our friends on the left. Our friends on the left say we're hypocrites because we're against uh, uh, parks and museums and fiat currency and the post office and, and public roads, and yet we use them. So they say we're hypocrites. No, those lefties are the hypocrites. You look at a lefty who's an egalitarian, look him in the eye, and if he's got two eyes, he's a hypocrite. <laughs> because he should have given up one of those eyes. I mean, if he followed his views. Now, Gary is falling into that trap. He's saying that if you, were, if you go on a public street, and I see no difference between a public street and a public university, they're both public. Anything Gary can say about the university, I can say about the roads or the parks or the museums or the post office, there's a man with a badge and a gun in all of these places. So what Gary is really saying, the logical implication for that is either be a hermit or commit suicide. <laughs> and this is not a tenable, a tenable view. 
Uh, so Gary is falling into this trap where the lefties criticize us for being hypocrites. No, no, we're not hypocrites. It's quite all right. Ragnar Danish called my man from Atlas Shrugged was forever going to government uh, places and grabbing their money. The, no problem with that. They stole the money from us. Gary is absolutely right here. He and I are 100% in agreement. The, the state is, uh, is an abomination. It's evil. It's stealing money. But it's good to take money from them. And if they'll give it to you for teaching in a public university, that's great. So don't be ashamed when you, uh, you know, I feel like uh, Malcolm X, when he first started, he was saying, throw away your hair straighteners. Don't be ashamed of being black. And I think this was magnificent. I'm a big fan of uh, Malcolm X. Well, I say, uh, throw away your uh, views that you shouldn't teach in a public university and throw away your views that you shouldn't use the public roads. I think Gary is leading you astray. He's leading you down the garden path here. He is uh, uh, accepting the, uh, the charge against us. Now, this PhD, the last point that I want to criticize uh, Gary on is this PhD glut. Yes, there's a PhD glut for poets and, and for other people who are driving cabs and stuff, but it's not true in economics. <laughs> so I, I think Gary makes some good points, but, but his views are very dated. Yes, uh, things are different now than when we were both students, mainly because it's much more heavily mathematicalized and uh, statisticalized, if I can use that as a word. But uh, uh, I'm basing my information on students that got their PhD a year or two ago. That, you can't get more recent than that. Thank you. One of the fundamental positions in politics, and I found in virtually every other field, is the old rule that you can't beat something with nothing. I have come out and I've said I don't think the pursuit of the PhD is not wrong for everybody, but it's a high-risk position. You've got to think through it very, very carefully as to what you're really submitting to, what you're committing to for the rest of your life in the system as it presently exists and is likely to exist in the future. A $430 billion a year oligopoly which is established by the government, protected by the government, and exists at the behest of the government in order to strengthen the government, I think you have to think very carefully about committing the rest of your life to that organization. So I'm going to talk about alternatives. I'm going to talk about five, four things. <clears throat> First of all, the position in Malcolm Gladwell's book, Outliers, which I think is a magnificent book that you need between approximately 10,000 hours of hard work to become a virtuoso. It doesn't mean you're going to be a virtuoso if you... Invest 10,000 hours, but if you don't invest 10,000 hours, you're not going to be a virtuoso. For basic real competency of mastery of a field, about 5,000 hours. Now, from my position is 50 hours a week for about two years. That will give you at least mastery. You can do that either as a master's program learning uh, Keynesian economics and mathematics, or you can do it on your own through the materials that are available through Mises Institute, and you can become a real master of Austrian economic theory. I think that is a wise way to go and certainly a reasonable way in terms of what most of us want to do with our lives. If you have to get a job, fine. You work 40 hours a week in the job. You put 20 hours a week in whatever time you're going to invest in, in mastering Austrian economics, and it takes five years instead of two years. If, if you want to be a virtuoso, it's going to take 10 years. So you'd be 30, 31, something like that, when you really have a demonstrated competency, real performance ability in the field of Austrian economics. And you can do it while getting paid a regular salary by a regular organization that is not, I believe, compromised by the state. Now, there's another point I want to go on to, which is there's a much broader audience than college students. And that audience is enormous. And it's growing very rapidly. And Ron Paul is one of the reasons why it's growing so rapidly. We have a market that is immense today compared with as recently as four years ago. And it's growing rapidly. And we got, we got Congress working hard. We got Congress working hard to grow it even more rapidly. So this is a trip. We're on the right side of the transaction between the government and us. Because they're going to screw it up and we're going to profit from it in terms of, of once again coming down to the public and saying the magnificent phrase that we all love, we told you so, okay? And, and more important, we told you why. 
We told you why, and Mises told us why. So your market is growing very, very rapidly. Compared to a few students in a classroom who are going through to get their, their tickets punched, most of them in undergraduate classes, unless you get a tenured position, those students going through getting their ticket punched are not there to get Austrian economics. They're getting their tickets punched in a department that is Keynesian or Friedmanian. They're not there for you, they're there for them. And the quid pro quo is we run ourselves through a system that is in opposition to Austrian economics. And by the way, if you get on the faculty in most schools, that's the game you gotta play. The textbooks are gonna be non-Austrian and you got no say in the matter. You're gonna teach them what you don't believe is true for the rest of your life and they don't care and they won't remember you and they won't probably learn Austrian economics from you, at least at the undergraduate level. Now, you may if you get tenure, but that's way down the track. What I'm saying is go to the people who want Austrian economics, go to the market that is interested in it, and go to it now. Now, how do you do it? Third point, the internet. And now I'm gonna get into what I do and have done, what Mises Institute does better than any other organization in the world with the possible exception of lourockwell.com. And I'm gonna tell you how it's done. First, you get your own YouTube channel and you get it before the end of the week. And if you don't know how to get it, you go to my site, garynorth.com, and you can find a, a free section of videotapes on, or not videotapes, boy, am I dating myself, of videos, <laughs> of digital videos on how to start a YouTube channel. Simple, free, next thing you do, start a wordpress.com blog site, and you can start more than one. Write on a regular basis. Get your ideas in front of yourself. Why do I write? Why does any writer write? To find out what I believe. And that's the truth. Now you better get it clear before you click the thing that says post, okay? <laughs> get that clear first, but you write. And the discipline of writing, you get better and better like any other skill. That's what I did. The most important skill I got out of graduate school was how to sell the Freeman an article. And that put me through graduate school, and it opened up my first career, that I wrote my way into this movement because I needed the money and because I believed in the system. You can, you've got to get WordPress.com, then you get your own website at some point using WordPress.org software, which is free. You get yourself a microphone for 20 bucks is all it takes as an external mic. You begin screencasting. You get Kindle. Kindle now, for any book under 10 bucks, they'll give you 70% of the money that comes through the door. If you got something to say, put it on Kindle and sell the thing. So you go to the website. You go to video editing software. You get a webcam, and you, you do the talking head with a lavalier mic where they can hear it and understand it. Wouldn't you like to have been the guys who did the Hayek versus Keynes rap video? Three and a half million hits, dwarfing any professor who's run through here in terms of impact. That's my strong opinion. Now, only a few guys can do it, but it can be done. It's free and it's powerful, and it stays up virtually forever. Write for lourockwell.com. Write for Mises. Get your spurs doing productive writing for an audience that wants to listen to what you have to say. And finally, if you really are any good, if you're really any good, teach on Mises Academy and make a decent living on the side if you got something to say that anybody is willing to pay for. You don't need accreditation. You don't join the cartel. You go to people and offer what you have got to sell based on what they want to buy. And Mises sits in the middle with the software and enables you to do that. And finally, let me get to the fourth point, how good are you? If you are really any good, you don't need a PhD. You don't need a PhD if you know what you're doing. And if you're really good, like Henry Hazlitt, you don't even need to go to college, okay? The, the, the point being, how competent are you? You can go through the hoops. If you're really not very good, or if you, you're after that lifetime income that you think you're gonna get, you can go through the hoops, the Keynesian hoops, the bureaucratic hoops, which proves that you can go through academic bureaucratic hoops, to which I say, hoop-de-doo. <laughs> 
what you got to do is master the field and produce, which is videos, audios, books, articles. If you've got it, do it. If you don't have it, then you may have to find a different approach. But my, my approach has been go to the market. And I'm very grateful that Mises and that Lou Rockwell did this on my behalf and on behalf of the millions of people who wind up reading these materials because I can write one article on lourockwell.com and reach more people than a professor can reach through his entire academic career. And if you write two or three articles, all the better. So, the, so my basic point is this. If you can speak, if you can write, if you can think, if you are disciplined, if you, if you do the hard work that you need to do to master a field, if you put in the 10,000 hours on what's true and not on what is false, if there's a market, you can make money, and if there's no market, get out of the field. How do we determine who wins this debate? <laughs> if we determine it on the basis of spontaneous applause and laughter, he wins. <laughs> he's magnificent. I mean, he's really a good public speaker. <laughs> but if we determine it on a different basis, he loses. <laughs> and I want to I, I, I wanna offer three criteria for judging this on the basis of which he loses. First of all, it seems to me that if you go 180 degrees off of your initial position, if you're converted by the other guy, God damn it, you lose. Now, you read the stuff he's been writing on lourockwell.com about this stuff, and he isn't saying anything like, don't, I don't say you shouldn't get your PhD. That's my uh, quote of what he just said. Rather, just be careful. It's a high risk. Well, that's my position. <laughs> Namely, right before your eyes, he changed his, his views. Now, I call that losing the debate. <laughs> Don't believe me. Go and read what he's written on this subject. He never said anything in those articles that I criticized about, oh, well, uh, I don't say no one should get a PhD. Uh, just be careful. He didn't say that at all, and yet he said that five minutes ago, or two minutes ago, whenever it was. He changed his views. That means you lose the debate. And that's very important, because the, the future of our movement is, is involved here. And if he keeps convincing people not to go and get a PhD, uh, our movement will be greatly weakened. I don't know why he's trying to undermine our movement in this way, and I think it's horrible. <laughs> OK, so that's one criteria of winning a debate. If you change your views, you lose the debate. The second one is, are you responsive to the other guy? Now, I've taken notes on what he said, and I've tried to be responsive to what he said, and he's not being responsive to what I said. Now, for example, he's talking about Keynesianism and mathematics. He said that again, that if you go and get a PhD, you're going to be, uh, uh, have Keynesianism and mathematics shoved down your throat. I'm putting it in my own words, but that's what he said. Go talk to Guido Holtzman. Ask him if he's shoving Keynesian and mathematics down his students' throats. Go talk to Ben Powell or talk to Ben Powell's students who are here and ask them if they're getting this stuff shoved down their throats. Now, I, he said that, I criticized it, and in his last debate, he ignores it. Well, if you ignore the other guy's statements, you lose the debate. You're supposed to be responsive. He's not, and again, he's repeating this, this nonsense about not being compromised by the state. He says, if you go teach... And here I agree with him. Most of the places you're going to go, except for Grove City and Hillsdale, are going to be public universities. And he goes on and on, and he waxes eloquent about how horrible it is to be in a public university. But he, he is not responsive to my point. If, if that were true, then you shouldn't be using the public roads, and you shouldn't be using fiat currency, and you shouldn't be going to public parks, museums, whatever. He doesn't respond to that. He ignores that. You lose the debate it seems to me, if you don't respond to these things. Laughter and applause will not win you the debate. And that's what he's got here. But when it comes to the substance of it, he ignores it. He ignores the, the opposite point of view, and he gets you to laugh and applaud, which is all well and good, and I wish I could do it myself. <laughs> I, I, I can't, but I'll, I'll uh, be content with just the, the substance. 
uh, this business of um, working 40 hours a week and then studying uh, 20 hours a week on your own, come on, give me a break. If you work 40 hours a week in, in a bank or an insurance company, you're tired. Compare that with going to graduate school and study with Guido Holtzman or, or Ben Powell or uh, Pete Becky, uh, who I don't agree with on much, but he churns out those people. There you, you're spending 60 hours a week learning economics. Not all of it Austrian economics, yes, but you have to learn the Keynesian crap. And I stand, <laughs> I stand next to no one in terms of my revulsion at Keynesian, but you have to learn it. You can't just learn Austrianism. You have to learn the other stuff too. And then this other point, uh, if you're really good. Come on, most of us are mediocre and I include myself. <laughs> No, seriously, most of us are not Henry Hazlitt's. Most of us are not Ludwig von Mises's. Most of us are not Murray Rothbard's. God damn it. We're, <laughs> we're just mediocre. We're just trying our best to promote liberty and promote economic understanding. So th this is, he's leading you down the garden path. You don't have to be excellent. You don't have to be a Murray Rothbard. You can just be a mediocre person like m myself and, and others and, and do your best and, and you can earn a living at this. But, but he's, he's right. He says, you don't need a PhD. Well, a PhD helps. It gives you a credential. Yes, so, uh, yeah. <laughs> Never tell the debater who has the final second response, <laughs> that he didn't make a response. <laughs> for I've been saving this. <laughs> and for those listening on the video, you must get to substantiate what I'm saying, a copy of Dr. Block's speech on unemployment. He made an eloquent case against the trade unions. He made, I think, a moral case against the trade unions. The moral corruption of using government guns and badges to keep people out of a field. To create a cartel by violence and the threat of violence. To create whole industries based on violence and guns and badges. Now, if he's going to believe his own position on the evils of the trade unions and the moral evil of using violence to keep people out of a field, to keep them from teaching, to teach them from offering competitive services, to create unemployment, to lock good people out because they did not conform to the rules of the trade union. If he believes that, one more time, why are you teaching in a university at $170,000 a year? Why? And that ain't funny. That's a moral question. And I'll tell you who my model was, and he's been my model for 35 years, and that was Dominic Armentano. Now, he said he'd never go into a state university. He taught at the University of, of Hartford. And I thought that was a strong position. But the bottom line is, if you go into academia, it is a government cartel it has taken $430 billion a year out of the American economy to sell overpriced goods to students who are running, running up now $24,000 of debt and parents running up bigger quantities, paying overpriced, cartelized prices for third-rate products. And if you ever break the cartel, you're going to see the production of what really needs to be done is Walmart University. Because I got no choice, I don't sell my soul to the devil to get his pay. That's why, Walter. And that's not funny, but that's the truth. Do not sell your soul to the system that you say you don't believe in and that your economics say is wrong when that system is a government established cartel and there, all, there are alternatives. There is Mises Academy. There are private schools that are not regulated by the state. There are homeschool programs. There's a way to make a living 
without joining the, the, the labor union of the modern academic system. Yes, you can profit if you get on the right side of the trade, if you leap the high barrier and get across and get that tenure position, yeah, it's profitable. But every time you hear the story about above market wages, you got to look for the question, where's the gun, where's the badge, and who's being left out of the system? That's what we do as Austrian school economists. Who wins, who loses? When you got winners, look for the losers. And if there's a guy with a gun and a badge standing between the loser and success, I say, don't be associated with the gun or the badge. Well, let's uh, please join me once more in thanking both of our participants. Uh -huh.